I want to invite you if you'd like to stand. And this morning we're going to do a new song. This is one of the songs we're going to actually do um, on Easter. So um, feel free to sing along and just praise the Lord with us. Joy. 
joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. the God who saves, cause sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause we hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. see y'all. Thanks for joining us this morning. As we have the chance to celebrate in the joy that is in the house of the Lord today as we reflect on the truths of who God is and who we are because of him. As we have a chance to celebrate in the gift that he is to us. So glad that you've joined us. A couple of announcements as we're stepping into worship today. One is um, to this Wednesday is our last Wednesday night for this session. So dinner's at 5.30, class at 6.00. The middle school youth group gets started at 5.45 and everything gets done at 7.15. So that's the final week coming up this Wednesday. And then just a reminder about Holy Week coming up, that we are going to have the Good Friday service here at Community Reform Church. It's the Community Good Friday service. The CMA puts this on, but we're hosting. And so if you're available on Friday, April 15th, I encourage you to join us at noon here uh, as we have a chance to reflect upon the truth of what takes place on that Friday. And that's a hard truth, but an important truth in this journey of faith that we're on. And then the Easter service, we're going to be at Charlevoix High School Middle School again. That's now available to us. So we're going to have one service at Charlevoix Middle High School at 9.30 on Sunday, April 17th. So hope you'll join us for that service. And then we also today have the privilege of getting a little update 
from Sasha. He sent me a video this morning. So if you're wondering what's going on with him in the Ukraine, remember Sasha and Luda are missionaries that we support that work with YWAM in the Ukraine. They're in Ternopil, which is kind of west, U- western Ukraine. And he sent this little video. It's about a minute and a half long. Just give you a little update on what they're experiencing, what he's seeing. And also he's given thanks too for, I think we've sent over about $10,000 um, from Community Reform Church to help them. So enjoy the video. Then I'll pray. Hi, guys. <clears throat> Hi, dear church. Thank you guys for caring for us and <clears throat> for your generosity, for the love that you express to us, and we really appreciate that. And we are doing okay at the moment, uh, still doing lots of work. Uh, all of the churches that are <clears throat> doing the relief project together, we are hosting up to 3,500 people every night and doing evacuation people from Kiev and to the Polish border to Romania. And hopefully this week we'll start again sending people to Germany and to uh, <clears throat> Czech Republic. Please continue to pray uh, for us because the need is overwhelming and there is lots of things to do. And uh, also if you can pray for my father-in-law, we evacuated him yesterday and uh, Luda, she went with her parents to Poland he is going through the cancer treatment at the moment, and it was already a shortage of medicine that he needed. And I think uh, today in the morning in a hotel in Poland, he had a heart attack. So he's in emergency room at the moment, and please pray. Otherwise, we're doing okay as much as we can. Thank you again, and bless you guys. We love you. Bye. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful that you know and are present in the midst of all that's taking place. Pray especially for Luda's dad and um, this possible heart attack and this battle with cancer and having to be evacuated from the Ukraine to Poland. Father, pray that you would provide um, Sasha and Luda and their family with all that they need. Pray that this heart attack isn't serious, that you provide strength for his father-in-law. Just pray that in the midst of that, they see and experience your presence and love. And we pray that you help Sasha and YWAM and the church within the Ukraine as they're seeking to be a source of encouragement, of truth, of love, of hope. And they're also seeking to provide physically the needs that exist for all of these refugees. Father, we pray for your hand to provide all that's needed. Just thankful for Sasha and all those followers of Jesus who are stepping up and expressing your love in pretty significant ways in the midst of this war that's taking place. And Father, we're thankful that we can be a part of not only praying but helping. So give us wisdom, each of us personally, in seeking to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the midst of circumstances like this and in the midst of the many other circumstances we see around us. Help us to be committed to following you, to serving and sacrificing. We pray that this time together as we worship helps us to grow in our capacity to be faithful to you, helps us to remember who we are and what we're called here for on this earth and help us to remember true the truth of who we are as children of God, that we are yours and that's forever. So may we, with our minds, with our hearts, with our everything that's a part of who we are, may we worship you today. And may we keep asking you to do that work in us that helps us embrace more and more deeply that identity that you've created us for. That we are forgiven, that we are free, that we are yours. So Spirit, do that work in each of us and help us to be open to it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand if you'd like to as we just continue to worship the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life.
Let's pray together. Father, help us to embrace that truth that we truly are yours. Because of what Christ has done for us, that our identity has changed. And that we truly are children of God, part of your family. And that that not only means that we get to go to heaven when we die, but we recognize the gift that that is in the presence of your spirit in our lives, that we truly are never alone. That as we embrace this identity as children of God, we recognize the responsibility that we've been given to continue and participate in the mission that you have for this world, a mission that's driven by love and sacrifice, a mission with this incredible message of grace and hope. So, Father, help us to embrace all of what it means that we've said yes to you, that it is all of our life, It is every relationship, every circumstance, every moment. And in that, we find the life. We grow. We see you work. We experience the power and the presence of your spirit. We live the life that we're created to live. And so, so Spirit, may this time in your word as we think about this call that you've given us to not only be receivers of the word of God in our life, but to be sowers of that word in this world. So help us to grow in our willingness and in our capacity to embrace that calling. Thank you for the gift of this word. Thank you, Father, for the way that it expresses your love to us, that you help us to know how to live And you help us to remember that you're with us always as we seek to do the work that you've called us to do. So Spirit, empower us to hear and to put into practice this word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the season of Lent. That kicked off on Ash Wednesday last week. And last Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent. So here we're stepping into the second Sunday of Advent. We've titled this series throughout the season of, uh, not Advent, Lent. Did I say Advent? I think I heard myself say Advent. We wish you a Merry Christmas. (laughs) Sorry. I don't want to skip summer and go right to winter again. (laughs) Anybody else? So we're in the season of Lent, this, this important part of the journey through the, the calendar of the church where so often Lent is a season for us to focus our attention specifically on Jesus' journey, not only to the cross, but to the tomb. And what we celebrate at Easter, what the resurrection of Jesus says about him and what the resurrection of Jesus means for our lives. And so it's an important season. It's a season that I hope that you do some self-reflection. You invite Jesus into that self-reflection that this is a time of repentance, a time of confession, a time to encourage you to be in prayer. And especially during this season, through the Eyes of Jesus series, we really encourage you to be in the Gospel of Mark. You know, we're giving you a practical way to do that through the 40 days of Lent. If you sign up for that, we're going to send you scripture every day and a little activity for you to participate in. But if not doing that, I just really encourage you, make the Gospel of Mark part of the journey for you through this season. And We won't cover everything that we find in Mark. We're going to focus in on some certain areas. But I think it's really helpful in preparation for that celebration at Easter and for embracing the significance of what Jesus has done, I encourage you to consider kind of participating in that way. So today we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Before they get, we get there, I want to invite a little bit of reflection on a term that you've probably heard if you've been in the church, but it's a term that so often comes, with, comes for me with a lot of guilt, and the term is evangelism. 
When I was at First Reformed Church in Granville, I had a number of different kind of responsibilities over the course of my time there. My job kind of evolved while I was there. But one of them is I was in charge of the evangelism team. And so we would consistently meet to talk about how do we share the good news of Jesus with our community. And it has always been a place where there's significant guilt for me. I always feel like this is an area where I tend to let God down. And sometimes I think it's because at times my perspective on evangelism was a, was a little bit messed up. And it wasn't as extreme as this next slide, but it went in towards that direction that if I really was a good Christian, that I needed to be saying the word hell a lot more than I actually wanted to. And this slide kind of illustrates some of the challenge, I think, in the midst of this conversation. Because maybe for some of you, when you hear the word evangelism, you hear the idea of, I've got to go talk to people I don't know and tell them they're going to hell unless they find Jesus. So get your act together and find Jesus. Can I give you a hug? I didn't, even this, just this, if you look at this slide, there's so much in here that just feels like it doesn't connect. That's just this serene picture of this beautiful blue water. But don't keep calm. Jesus is coming, and if you don't repent, you're going to hell, mate. So clearly it's coming from the Australia area of our world. I just wonder if you have some baggage like I do regarding this area of evangelism. Because the core of evangelism is good news. Right? That term means good news, sharing good news, expressing good news. And it was often used as a term when, when back in the Bible days, when, when the king would send his army out and they'd win a victory, they'd send back evangelism. They'd send back evangelio, which is good news. The good news is we won the war. The good news is we won the battle. And you and I know that our news is so much better than simply winning a war. That we have a responsibility and a calling to express the good news of Jesus to the people in this world. And I hope this message will be an encouragement to grow in your capacity to do that and maybe to be willing to let go of some of the misconceptions or the baggage that at times we carry that hinders us from doing that. Because I don't think you need to start with hell to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So I'm getting more and more convicted that these three words really reflect part of the journey of evangelism, of sharing the good news. And as you're going to see in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, I think it's in many ways what is illustrated in regards to how you and I need to continue to grow in our faith. You know, one of the common practices around here, if you do premarital counseling with me, or if you join, walk through the inquirers class, or if you're interested in joining the, the, joining the church, that part of what you're going to experience is we're going to ask you to tell your story. And ask you two simple questions. How did you become the person that you are today? And how did you come to the place that you're at in your faith today? And it's really hard to answer that question without sharing your story. Talking about your family and what you experienced there. Talking about the people who have had an influence in who you are today. Both good and not so good. Talking about those experiences or circumstances at times in your life that have helped you to grow. Talking about those blessings that you've experienced. And often those blessings are people. And then talking about your church experience, talking about your faith experience. Whether that's no faith growing up and you found faith later in life, or whether it's I grew up in the church all my life and some of what my growth has been is unlearning some of what I learned in church and stepping more deeply into some of what I've learned in church. But I'm more and more convinced that there is power in story. And that one of the primary ways that we can help people experience the gift of God's love is by being willing to hear their story. 
Because I think it's out of that hearing of story that so often we move much more clearly into who people are. I don't know about you, but I'm tempted to judge people by first impression. You ever done that? None of you? Just me? (laughs) And how easily that comes. How I can have one conversation or even just look at a person's appearance and all of a sudden in this kind of this self-righteous, judgmental way, I know who they are. But every time, every single time, I'm willing to do the work of hearing a person's story, of getting to know them, of making space to better understand how they've become the person that they are or better understand some of what's been a part of the journey of faith for them that I really feel like I get to know them. And it's so interesting how the value that I see in them increases so quickly, how much my compassion quotient quotient increases exponentially the more that I hear people's stories, the more that I'm willing to really get a sense of who they are. I think another way to say that is this, and it's part of what you're going to hear in Jesus' parable today, the parable of the sower. You're going to see this word listen in a couple different places. There's something so powerful about listening not only listening to each other, not only listening to your kids, your grandkids, listening to your spouse, listening to the people you work with, but part of the call of faith is to listen to the word of God, to listen to the story of Jesus, to let that story guide and direct our lives, to let his word be the life that we look for, the, the words of life that we long for, the words of life that guide and direct our steps. Listening is such a core part of it. Because in listening to the story of Jesus, we come to know him better. And listening to the story of the people in your life, you come to know them better. And it's out of that place of knowing that we are much more capable and willing to love because we are created to be known. When you and I do the work of knowing one another or knowing Jesus, really pursuing that relationship, we grow our capacity to not just feel love, but to express love. So we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark today, chapter 4, but I want to remind us how Mark starts. So the author for um, this gospel is more than likely John Mark, who walked alongside Peter. And that really, they see the gospel as Mark, has been kind of Mark's experience walking alongside Peter and collecting what Peter had to say about faith, about God, about what God was teaching him and showing him. And it's the gospel of Mark that Matthew and Luke both use in their authorship of their books, Mark is seen as a primary source for both Matthew and Luke. Mark was not one of the 12. He wasn't walking alongside Jesus. He was walking alongside Peter. And and what he expresses here today is expressed so clearly in the first verse of the first chapter of Mark. Because it's not about Mark. There's some debate about authorship of Mark because there's no indication of who wrote the book. He doesn't come out and say, this was written by me. Because the purpose of his book is this, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that the gospel of Mark is about Jesus Christ and the good news, the message of Christ, the truth of Christ, the work of Christ. That's what this gospel is about. So the title of this message out of the gospel of Mark chapter 4 verses 1 through 20 is Tending the Soil. And for those of you who've been in the church for a while, you're going to recognize this parable pretty clearly. It's one that's commonly shared within churches. There's multiple interpretations that could come out of this message. I'll share a few of those. But this is the Gospel of Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there. While the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. There's a couple things to draw your attention to, because this just seems like the introduction. Let's get to the piece of the teaching. 
But I think it's important to note a couple things in this. First, he's not standing in the synagogue teaching. He isn't teaching just to the religious people. That he has gone out. He is out and about. He is with the crowds. And he is teaching whoever is willing to hear that teaching. So more than likely, there's Jews and Gentiles that are a part of this. And the crowd has gotten large. Word is spread. People want to hear what he has to say. There's something very attractive about Jesus. There's something about him that draws people to him. They want to hear what he has to say. Jews and Gentiles alike. Verse 2, he began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow. And I, again, I, I really want to encourage you to consider this word listen. Listen and really hear. Don't just listen with that passive, yeah, 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 kind of listening. Listen, because what I'm about to say really matters. And you may hear what I'm about to say, but you may not really hear. So listen. Listen. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So sower, what does a sower do? A sower sows. A sower spread seed. And one of the places that that sower spread seed was on the rocky path. And that seed didn't last long. Verse 5, other seed, seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depths of soil. Sometimes part of what we know about soil is it may look good on top. There may be a very thin layer of really healthy soil, but right underneath is shale or limestone or some rock formation that maybe the seed can begin to start, but it has no foundation. There's no root. And as a result of that, didn't grow. Verse 6, And when the sun rose, it was scorched. Since it had no root, it withered away. One of the impacts of that shallow foundation, that lack of a root structure, is it can't handle some of the intensity that at times the climate brings. It can't handle the heat of the sun, and so it withers. Verse 7, Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. So the sower seed's not doing so well so far. Right, we got the path, we got the shallow soil, and now we've got soil that doesn't seem to be shallow, but there's all sorts of other things around it, weeds growing that are choking what's growing from that good seed, and it yielded no grain. And then verse 8, other seed fell into the good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 36 and 60 and 100 fold. So this seed falls on good soil, and in that soil the seed flourishes and the seed grows, and there's multiple harvests that takes place here. 30, 60, maybe even 100 fold grow out of this good soil where this seed has been planted. Verse 9, and he said, Jesus said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. So you, you could take multiple interpretations from this parable. This parable could be about the good news that we just read about, that the harvest is coming, there will be a harvest that will be produced, even though three out of the four places where the seed falls, it doesn't seem to do well. But in the good soil, there is a harvest coming. We look forward to that. You could also take this 
parable and look at it through the lens of patience, that as we're seeking to do evangelism, as we seek to share the good news, we have to recognize that as we spread that seed, that truth of Jesus to the people around us, that there is not always going to be a positive response, that in some places it's going to fall short. The soil is not interested or ready or wants to hear from that seed. So it doesn't take root. It doesn't grow for multiple reasons that we ought to be patient and recognize that not all of this spreading of seed that we're called to as followers of Jesus Christ is going to bear fruit. You could also look at this parable, and I think I'm pressing more into this area today, of the responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus to be sowers of the seed be those that are seeking to spread the word of God, the truth of Jesus to the people in our lives, that we have a calling and a responsibility that God's given us to do that, that we could press into that, which I think would be a real, very appropriate interpretation of this text. But one of the other interpretations that I think is really important for us to embrace here is the power and the gift of the seed, of recognizing this seed as the word of God. And as the word of God takes root in people's lives, it will grow. It really is about the word of God. It is about the gospel. It is about the story of Jesus. At its core, that's what matters most. And it's by that word that lives are transformed. It's by that word that change comes to people's lives. It's by that word that we see the source of grace and forgiveness. And we hear the story of God's love expressed through Jesus' sacrificial journey to the cross. That that is a word that we we don't need to simply hear once and think we're all set. But that you and I need to be stewards of that word, not only in the spreading of that word to people in our lives, but in the willingness to keep listening to that word, to keep coming back to that word, to keep letting that word be the means by which God speaks into our life in a significant, in a profound, in a consistent way, that we need to keep hearing that word. We keep needing to be reminded and challenged and exhorted on the story of Jesus Christ. We need to keep listening to him. And one of the primary ways we do that is through his word. And let anyone with ears to hear, listen. Verse 10, when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the 12, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. That's a hard text. That text is taken from Isaiah chapter 6 when the call is placed upon Isaiah's life to be a messenger for God. When he has this vision where he's before the throne and he recognizes his unclean cleanliness. I'm a man of unclean lips. Who am I? But God calls him. Whom shall I send? Who will go forth for me? And Isaiah says, I will. And it's following that part of Isaiah chapter 6 that this text is found. That the message that Isaiah is going to give is this message that people will hear it, but they won't perceive it. They won't respond to it. They'll listen, but they don't, won't understand. That there will be an unwillingness to let this word be heard. It's part of the journey that Isaiah is called to, and it's part of the recognition that's part of what we experience in this world today. That some will listen, but they are not open to or willing to hear. And so there are different descriptions in the parable of how that response comes. For some, it falls on a path. The path is purpose isn't about growing seed. A path is for people to walk on. So there's no interest in hearing. 
For some, they may be open to that hearing for the short term, but there's no depth. There's no willingness to embrace this call to obedience. There's no willingness to experience the reality of persecution and the challenge of living out our faith. And so it's shallow ground. It comes up, but it doesn't last. And then some of that seed falls in the places where, yeah, it takes root and it starts to grow, but we start to turn our eyes in other directions. We start to get caught up in the things of this world and all of a sudden values and priorities and purposes change and the weeds choke what has been growing. It's part of the reality that we face and as much as we may want to try to change people's minds or hearts or tell them what they should or shouldn't be doing, our responsibility isn't to grow the seed, but to spread it, share it. He goes on, verse 13, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all parables? A couple of quotes that stood out to me in this work that go after this. First from David Garland in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark. It's the NIV application commentary. It says this, Jesus did not strive to make things easier for the crowds to comprehend or to make them feel more comfortable. His enigmatic, which means difficult to understand teaching, served to separate those who were curious from those who were serious, those who were seeking only a religious sideshow from those who were truly seeking after God. He was intent on eliciting a genuine faith, and Mark's gospel insists that faith is born of the tension between the revealing and the veiling of the truth. Let those who have ears listen. Do you really want to hear? Do you really want to see? Do you really want to know? Another quote that stood out to me from, um, well, no, verse 4. No, no, it is a quote. Why is it not in here? There it is. Sorry. One other quote that stood out to me in his commentary was this. There's a distinction that exists between the secret of Jesus' identity and the mystery of the kingdom. The secret of Jesus' identity as the Messiah and Son of God has been revealed to the reader in the prologue. That's how Mark starts his gospel. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. The secret of the kingdom is that people cannot see that his sowing the word, which will lead to his crucifixion and resurrection, is God's decisive eschatological action. Those who think the things of men do not perceive that defeat turns into victories, that the rejected one is indeed the cornerstone, that the risen one is Jesus who was crucified. The kingdom of God is advancing, not just through miracles, but also through suffering and through persecution. Right? Part of the challenge that you see throughout the Gospels is the listeners often want Jesus to be formed in their image. They want to determine what he does and who he is and how he acts instead of seeing him for who he is and embracing the message that he was sharing about how the kingdom of God comes into this world through humility, through sacrifice, through even suffering and death. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. There's two things I hope you take from that verse. One is your own story of faith. That God has sowed the word of God into your life. And it's by God's gracious, sacrificial work in your life that seed has taken root. And the growth that's taken place is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That God has placed that seed in your life and has given you the gift of relationship with him. Because for us to be faithful in this call to evangelism, for us to be sowers of the word in people's lives around us, we need to continue to receive that word in our lives. 
We need to continue to let God place that and grow that word in each one of us. We need to always have the posture of receivers as we invite that word and as we seek to listen to God at work in the midst of our life. And, and, we recognize our calling to do this work. That we have a responsibility to share that word, to spread that seed. And to recognize that it's to be to the people that are part of our life. Whether it's on the path or the shallow soil or in the midst of people's lives who are caught up with all sorts of other things. We don't know all that's so for them. We don't know what, what that seed will do once it's planted in their life. But we are called to spread it. We are called to share it. Because it is incredible news. It is the best news. It is what every person in our life needs. So Jesus goes on to explain the parable. And he says this, These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. They're not interested in the word. They're not interested in what God desires to say. Their life is caught up in other things. And there is no interest for this seed. Verse 16, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arise on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others, verse 18, and others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. And then finally, verse 20, and these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. Again, part of the challenge for each of us is to embrace the reality that we are called to sow the word, to sow the seed. That it's our, not our job to prejudge the soil. It's not our job to determine who should or could receive this word. That it needs to be spread in our family. It needs to be spread in our workplaces. It needs to be spread in our neighborhoods. It needs to be spread throughout this community. That as you and I recognize the influence God has given us, as we look at the relationships and the places that he's placed us, we recognize a primary calling we have, wherever we are, is to be sowers of this seed. Spread it. And again, I wish right now I could see what's buzzing up in your head. Because it's not handing out a tract. It's not telling people they're going to hell. It's not this angry, judgmental approach that I think so often, sometimes that's what we think we're called to. We are called to love at our core. And love means to be willing to step into people's lives and to sow that seed and to recognize that for some of that sowing, it takes time, it takes effort. But it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to do it. Sometimes that sowing looks like you're on a plane sitting by somebody you'll never have a chance to talk to again and the Spirit leads to you to share a little of your story or a little bit what you believe about what matters most in life. You plant this, you throw out a seed. Sometimes that seed, looks, that sowing looks like that ongoing commitment you have to your children and your commitment to raise those children in the faith. And so you are seeking consistently to let that seed fall in the soil of their life. 
And you have that responsibility, that calling to help them not just hear about Jesus, but to see Jesus in the midst of your life and how you live and how you do marriage and how you navigate all that comes in the midst of your life. You are sowing seed. That seed often is spread when we're willing to see the people that work for people. And as the Holy Spirit leads to step into their life, to initiate a conversation over coffee, to ask if we can pray for them in the midst of a circumstance that we know that they're wrestling with, or to do some of the work that we started with, just invite them to share a little bit more of the story of their life with you. Sowing seed. Sowers sow. And we leave the growing, we leave the response of that seed falling into the soil of people's lives, we leave that up to God. And that we recognize not all the seeds that we spread are going to take root. But that's not up to us. Our responsibility is to be people that sow that seed. So let me take you back to that where I started. I hope part of what you hear in the midst of this message is just a reminder of how the story of Jesus has transformed your story. I hope we get reminded once again of how overwhelming it is to see how God has expressed his love to us. That as we remember a cross and we remember an empty tomb and we remember the suffering and the persecution that Jesus experienced, We remember the ways that he went out and sought to show us who he is by preaching from the sea or standing on the side of a mountain or stepping into people's lives where they were or going to the tax collector's house. He was constantly sowing seed. And think of the impact that that seed has had in your life in the way that his story has helped us to see who he is, helped us to see that he is God that he is the gift of ultimate value. And how as we look at our own stories, how that's changed who we are. And in changing who we are, helped us to really embrace the identity that we are created with. That we are loved, that we are known, that we are his in the midst of a world that wants to define you in so many other ways. Comparing yourself to others based on your appearance or how much you own or possess or how important your job is or how how funny you are, how smart you are, how athletic you are. There's so many ways that the world encourages us to believe our value is found in something like that. But to really know that you are loved and that you are known as you are. With a God alongside of you seeking you seeking to help you truly embrace that identity and live into the fullness of life that you're designed for. And I think as we're willing to step into people's lives, as we're willing to hear their story, as we're willing to show them how much they matter, how much we care and love them, that it's in that space that I think so often the opportunities arise for us to express the truth of our own story and the foundation of our story being the story of Jesus Christ. That as we let people into our lives, after we've earned the right in their life, we have this opportunity to express the truth of Jesus Christ to them. Because our lives testify to the love that we express that Jesus has for them. They've already begun to experience it through the way that we have imperfectly loved them. And so again, thinking about it a little bit differently, it just emphasizes how important it is that we are a people that seek to listen. You and I need to make the word of God a priority in our life. We need to keep hearing the story of Jesus. We need to keep believing that that spirit at work in us illuminates his word and helps us to grow, helps us to see and to remember, helps us to 
reorientate our lives at times. It helps us at times to be convicted of our sin, that we need to keep hearing that word in our lives. Because it's in that we, we grow in our knowing of Jesus Christ and our knowing of who we are and our recognition of our need for him. And both in the experience of the love that he has for us and the responsibility that we're given as we see how deeply that love runs in our life to testify to that truth in the lives of those around us. One of the things that stood out to me in my research, kind of summed this up, is if we receive Jesus' word faithfully, we will do his will fruitfully. It's so important for us to continue to let that word be spoken in our lives, to continue to open our Bibles, to continue to read his story, to continue to let God speak to us through his word, to continue to let that word guide and direct our life. One of the things I read, um, I don't remember who said it, but they were talking about how within the church, and this was the, the church history, this is one of the early church fathers speaking this truth, but I think it's true today. Within the church, there are unbelievers. There are unbelieving believers. That I think are so often reflected in the way that the seed has fallen on a path or a shallow soil or people get caught up in the things of this world and they come to church every Sunday, but they are unbelieving believers. And that part of the challenge for each one of us is to be a believing believer. Where not only are we seeking to really listen to that word, to understand that word as best as we can. But that believing part of that word for us means that it's reflected in our commitment to how we live our lives. That you would see it in the actions of our life. You would see it in our commitment to be sowers of the word in the lives of those around us. So may God help us to be believing believers. May we sow that seed and may we trust in the power of the Spirit to help us to do that. Because those opportunities in every single one of our lives are bountiful. We do not lack opportunities to sow the seed in people's lives around us. So may we courageously and faithfully and dependently upon God's Spirit be sowers of that seed. May we share that word, the truth of Jesus, with the people around us. Let's pray together. God, we're so thankful for the gift of this word and somewhat the conviction that comes in the midst of it. I hope that as any guilt has arisen within us, that that guilt leads us to action, that that guilt leads us to taking more seriously our responsibility to be those that express the truth of Jesus Christ to this world, that we really are the bearers of good news. It's not bad news, it is good news if people are willing to receive that news. But if that seed falls on ground that does not, that soil that is not allowing it to grow, it really is bad news. It's news about separation. Father, that's your work, not ours. Help us to be faithful in this calling, to be sowers of the seed. And we give thanks, Father, for the way that you've sown that seed in our life and for the many people who have been part of that sowing of that seed in our life. We give you thanks for them. Help us, Father, to be faithful in our commitment to sharing the truth, the good news of Jesus Christ with the people in our life. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to invite you, if you'd like to stand as we sing our last song. Great are you, Lord. It's through our stories of what we've gone through that we're able to say, great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love.
So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. So may we keep pouring out that praise. May we do so in the way that we love and share that love of Jesus, the truth of who he is with the people in our lives. Go now, go now knowing the gift of his grace. Go now knowing that you are loved beyond comprehension. And go now knowing he is always with you. He is the power in which we serve him. Go in peace. Amen.